This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. The United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods applies to contracts between two parties where the buyer and the seller are in different states, hence the word international. And there are two possibilities, where, well, actually there are three possibilities, are there? The first possibility, which we're not interested in at all, is where um, the state of the buyer and the state of the seller, uh, neither of those states has signed into this international convention. In which case, that's the end of the lecture. But that's not what we're interested in. We're looking at this international convention and we have two possibilities. The ideal one is where both parties are members of or, or um, nationals of states that have signed in to the convention. And the second possibility is where only one of the parties is a member of the state um, or the location of the party's business is in a state that has signed into the convention. It's not the nationality of the individuals that is important. It's the location of their business, the location where the trade is being carried out. And in this later stage, when there was only one of the states that's accepted the convention, in that situation, the contract between the accepting that the person from the accepting state and the person from the non-accepting state must agree at the time of contract that in the event of a dispute, then we shall look at the United Nations Convention on Contracts of International Services as a means of resolving that dispute. So nationality not important, location of the party's business is important. Contracts not covered. Well, before we can talk about the contracts that are not covered, we need to know what is a contract that is covered by the United Nations Convention on the International Sale of Goods. And before we can do that, I really ought to say, almost by way of introduction, that this is this lecture, this particular chapter, is by way of an introduction to contracts and international contracts. Uh, and in later lectures, we'll be looking at the obligations of the seller, the obligations of both the buyer and the seller, the rights and duties. Uh, of both the buyer and the seller, and, and the resolution um, of those matters, of, the, of any disputes. So we shall be looking at that. But this, this lecture is by way of introduction to the world of contracts. It's a big area in the English the law variant, F4 variant, less so in the um, global variant, but nevertheless it is important. A contract. The contract for the sale of goods is one where the seller agrees to transfer title, that's a fancy word for ownership, where the seller agrees to transfer title to the goods to the buyer for a money consideration. That's what a contract is, that's a, an international contract for the sale of goods. To be a contract, it's where the seller in one state agrees to transfer the title of the goods which are the subject of the contract to the buyer in another state for a money consideration. Now that definition automatically excludes contracts for the supply of services because they're not goods. Uh, contracts for the exchange of goods. Again, it's not a money consideration. Exchange of goods, the English word for an exchange of goods is barter, um, where I will transfer the ownership of this pen um, so I am the seller and I'm agreeing my intention is to transfer title ownership of this pen to you and you will agree to transfer ownership of your car to me then we have a, a contract but it's not a contract for the international sale of goods that is is a contract but it doesn't fall into international sale of goods. Where one of the parties has the main obligation to supply labour and or, the next one, where one of the parties has the main obligation of, of providing substantially just the materials. So where the buyer of the, of the goods, where the buyer provides all the material or substantially all the material, then that's not an international sale of goods. All I'm doing is buying your construction services. I'll provide all the material and you provide me with the, the knowledge and the skills to construct that material into my nuclear power station. 
Where goods are purchased for personal, family, or household use. Now, this version that I'm looking at, and you're looking at this lecture, this version that I'm looking at says on this dot, 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 unless the seller knew or ought to have known about the proposed use. Now, I have to say that I'm going to have to alter these notes. So by the time you're looking at this lecture, these notes may well have been altered. But at the moment, you can see I'm working on unaltered ones. If you have got this version in front of you, then you need to make this alteration now. And it's a radical alteration. It changes the meaning of this line 180 degrees. I missed it when I was proofreading. Because it, it makes sense in terms of the letters and the words to follow. But it's 100% wrong. So what I'm going to do, and what you should do if you have the same version, is you need to insert these words. Unless the seller... neither knew nor ought to have known. A radical alteration to the meaning of that line. They neither knew nor could they reasonably have known of the, the fact that this was going to be personal use. And if I didn't know, if I'm a seller and you're buying my goods, I'm willing to sell you the title to these goods to the buyer for a money consideration and you're going to use it for your own personal use. How could I know that? And if I don't, if I couldn't reasonably have known, then the International Convention would apply. But if you tell me, and when I buy these goods, I'm going to use them in my home, that's for personal use. And I have then been told, I've been notified that the International Convention is not applicable. Where goods are bought at auction. We'll come to that um, later. I'm, I'm going to mention auction sales later on in this lecture, not, not too far away. Where they're bought by local authority, by legal authority. In the event of war, one state is fighting its neighbour and the, the state needs metal in order to construct tanks and aeroplanes and, and weaponry, cannons and, and whatever. And so it says to uh, a business, neighbouring business, it says to the neighbouring business, we're going to take all your metal from you, we're going to sequester all your metal in order that we can construct and they would presumably pay some compensation but it's not an international convention uh, contract because it's being bought under legal authority so international convention on contracts for the international sale of goods sorry the united nations convention for the international sale of goods will not apply in that situation purchase of stocks and shares stocks and shares represent an interest in a company. They don't represent goods. So it's not an international sale of goods and therefore the United Nations Convention on the contracts of the international sale of goods does not apply. Purchase of ships or aircraft, vessels, or hovercraft, things like that, are, they don't. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I don't know why. I don't know why a purchase of a ship or a uh, an aircraft or a hovercraft or a vessel or a submarine. I don't know why they do not fall within. And another strange one, the purchase of electricity. Why, why, why specifically just electricity? Why not gas and water and, and, and other? Oh, I wonder. I wonder. If I buy and have installed some solar panels, I can create, I can generate electricity. The electricity generate, that, that I generate will go into the national grid and then I will draw from the national grid. So I'm, and hopefully the national government will pay me for that electricity that I generate. And I can't generate water. I can't generate gas, at least not on a commercial scale, but I can generate electricity on a commercial scale. I wonder if that's the reason why electricity is specified, is singled out as being not uh, a commodity that is not covered by the United Nations Convention on Contracts and International Sale of Goods. Or is it just the fact that electricity isn't a good? 
It's not something tangible that you can put your hold it. You can't put your hands on it. I don't know. But anyway, purchase of electricity is not covered. Contracts of the purchase of electricity is not covered. Here we go. Contracts are agreements. And an agreement is two elements. It's got the offer and the acceptance. Now, you need to be careful here because there is a third possible word which becomes involved. And we're coming to it on this page. We're coming to it. But you need to be clear in your own mind what we're talking about. So an agreement is an offer and acceptance. Well, once I make you an offer and you accept that offer, we are then in an agreement. And in English law, it doesn't matter whether that agreement is in writing or not. I can make an offer to sell you this pen for, for three pounds and you say, yes, OK. But there's nothing in writing. But we are in a contract. I make an offer, you make the acceptance, complete, unconditional, no duress, money is involved. Fine, we're in contract. But then you change your mind. I'm going to find it difficult to take you to court and prove that you said yes, you were going to buy my pen for three pounds. That's another matter, that's another problem. The agreement should be supported by consideration. The word consideration, remember I bought your car, I exchanged your car for a pen. Do you remember that? Well, you're going to turn around maybe and say, well, a pen is clearly not of the same value as my car. That doesn't matter. I'm offering you something of value in exchange for you giving me something of value. And something of value is all we need for it to be consideration. Consideration, a very short form definition of consideration is something of value. So the agreement should be supported by consideration. International sale of goods, United Nations Convention on the Contracts for International, it's got to be money consideration, not a pen. It's got to be money consideration, moving from one party to the other. I may be paying you money for your car, you may be paying me money for my pen, but it's a money consideration. It's made with intention to create legal relations. I've not mentioned that, but clearly my offer of of a pen in exchange for your car is hardly intended to create legal relations. Not really intended to, is it? It's me making an illustration of a point. If I was serious and, and, and preempted this by saying, here's a serious offer, I shall exchange my pen for your car, then that's no longer um, an illustrative example. That is a serious offer. And if you accept it, then we're in a contract. But for the purposes of this lecture, it's all illustrative. An offer should be sufficiently definite proposal for concluding a contract. It's addressed to one or more. Do you know I can make the offer to you or to your colleagues at work or to your family and your colleagues at work or to your family and everybody that your family knows or everybody that is in your family and, and all your contacts and all their contacts and all their contacts. I can make an offer to the world at large so that anybody, anywhere, any one of the seven billion members of the human race is able to accept my offer. That's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> but it's possible. It's addressed to one or more person. It indicates the intention and willingness of the offeror. And it indicates the goods involved. Let me come back to that world at large thing. Typically, it's a reward case um, where my dog has disappeared and, and I'm so upset by the disappearance of my dog that I put an advert in my local newspaper and said, offered a £100 reward offered for the safe return of my dog. And somebody in Australia... Uh, writes me a letter and says, I've just received a copy of the Berry Times uh, and I've read your advert offering a £100 reward. Just give me a couple of days to clear up my affairs in Australia and I'll be on the next plane over. I'll start looking as soon as I land in Manchester. I'll start looking for your dog. Well, yeah, that can happen. And what's more, they don't have to write to me. They don't have to notify me of their acceptance. All they have to do to indicate their acceptance of my offer is return the dog to me. If they return the dog and they knew, that's important, they knew of the £100 reward offer, 
then they're entitled to claim it. It indicates the goods involve the quantity of the price and therefore it qualifies for the expression sufficiently definite. That an offer is a sufficiently definite proposal. It's got to be enough certainty. If I offered to sell you a car for £20, it doesn't say what sort of car it is, it doesn't give you the registration number, it doesn't even say whether the car is viable and whether it works. It doesn't say whether it's a wreck or even whether it's a miniature car. It doesn't say it's not sufficiently certain. Offers must be distinguished from invitations. So this is the, the third element that I was telling you about. I've just recently had a, a substantial fire removed from my house um, because it didn't work. It's, it's a very expensive fire and I'm very upset by the fact but since then, of course, I've got my solar panels and they're generating all the electricity that I need, so I don't need a fire. So it's now been taken out, the wall has been covered over, it's been replastered, now been painted, and the fire is actually sitting outside. And a plumber came round to do some repairs. He said, oh, what's happening with your fire? And I said, I'm getting rid. Oh, are you? He said, looking interested. I said, yeah, are you interested? Yeah, I could be. How much do you want? So I said, well, make me an offer. You make me an offer. Now that make me an offer, me saying that to him, is an invitation. Uh, it's, it's called an inv invitation to treat. Make me an offer, I said to this plumber man. And he did. He said, I'll offer you 500 euros. So I have got an invitation that I make to him, as the result of which he makes me an offer. And if I then say, I accepted, we're in a contract. But an invitation can't be accepted. You can't accept an invitation. It's a strange concept, that isn't it? Because if I invite you to a party, uh, you would normally accept. But if I invite you to make me an offer, that itself is not an offer. It's an invitation for you to make me an offer. And therefore, it's not capable of acceptance. So an invitation is not capable. It's the preliminary, but there's the agreement. There's the contract. And this has nothing to do with that contract. It's simply a primer, if you like. It's, it's like when you're starting a motor, and you, you, you prime it and get some fuel into the tank so that you can then pull the Kickstarter. Invitation is inviting another person. Make me an offer. That's an invitation. Goods in a supermarket, they're invitations. You might find that strange, but you go to your, your local supermarket and the shelves are there, and underneath is a price tag, packet of cornflakes, underneath it says 20 cents. Whoa, that's not bad, is it? So it's a, an invitation. So you take the packet of cornflakes off the shelf and you put it in your trolley and you go to the checkout. And the checkout person scans it across the scan and she's the person, I nearly said she, but that could be a he, of course. And the checkout person says, that will be $2, two euros, whatever. And he says, no, no, no. It says 20 cents on the shelf. It actually says 20 cents on the packet itself. And the supermarket checkout person says that's just an indication of the sort of level of amount that we're expecting you to suggest as your offer but i'm rejecting your offer at 20 cents and i'm saying here's my offer i'll sell it to you for two dollars i'm rejecting your your offer when you say i'll buy it from you for 20 cents i'm rejecting that here instead is my offer my counter offer uh, pay me two euros, pay me two dollars, and the conflicts are yours. Isn't that strange? The same with goods in a shop window, they're invitations, they're not offers. You go along and say, Can I buy that? that, that I'll, I'll accept, I'm sorry, I'll accept that um, offer that you've made of the, the figure of four euros for that ancient third dynasty Ming vase. I'll, I'll accept that offer. And you say, Well, it's not an offer, it's just a to get you into the shop, and now you're here, can I interest you in this pen? So, goods in a shop window are invitations, they're not offers. Adverts are normally invitations, there are 
exceptional cases where an advert has been taken to be an offer, and those are in the reward cases where I had my dog, if you remember, and I offered a reward, that would be an offer, um, where a reward is offered for information leading to, and you provide me that information that leads to, then you have accepted my offer. So a reward situation, an advert of a reward, is taken normally to be an offer. Process of an auction sale constitutes the auctioneer's inviting a series of offers. I've got this pen here. Do you want to buy it? Make me an offer. Two dollars. Okay, two dollars. Two dollars. Three dollars. It's against you. Three dollars. The person here on my left. Four dollars. Do I hear? Four dollars. Five. Five fifty. I'll take fifty. Five fifty. Five fifty. Going once. Going twice. I've invited a series of offers. I've in invited people to make me an offer. I could accept at any time. I said sold and that's the accepted sold 550 and that's the acceptance of their final offer so a process of an auction sale constitutes the auction is inviting a series of offers and until a hammer comes down accepted then the series of offers continues to flow so we have offers and they are half of the agreement the expression of willingness to be bound on specific terms must be certain. There was a case in English law about um, I'll buy a horse from you uh, and, and the seller says okay and you'll pay me an extra hundred pounds if the horse is lucky. Well it's a race horse and he obviously meant if, if it was lucky in, in its races if it won some races then we'd get that extra hundred pounds. But you know you can look at lucky in a different way. If it's lucky and it's not sold to the local slaughterhouse, the local butcher, and it's cut up as meat, that, then it will be a lucky horse not to have been cut up as meat. Or if it manages to complete a race in last place, but it was lucky because it didn't fall over a fence and had to be shot, it was still lucky. So lucky is not certain enough. There's no certainty about lucky. Oh, I was lucky in that exam. I thought I was going to score less than 20. But I scored eventually, I scored 39. So that was lucky, wasn't it? So lucky is not certain enough. It must be certain, it's not certain if it's just lucky. It must still exist when it's accepted. A number of ways in which an offer can no longer exist. For instance, I offered to sell you my pen because the auction didn't go through. I offered to sell you my pen for $2. And you say, no, I'll offer you a dollar fifty. Well, when you said that, you destroyed my offer. My offer is no longer on the table. And I said, hey, you get lost, you're not having it for a dollar fifty. So you say, oh, all right, then I'll pay you two. No. No, the, the offer no longer exists. You destroyed it when you counter offered, when you made me that when you rejected my offer and said I'll pay you one fifty. That destroyed my offer. So, if you reject it, or if you make me a counter offer, or if I withdraw my offer, or if I revoke my offer, I'll come to those in a moment, or if it's a, a period of lapse of time, if an offer is made and then time passes and it passes, and I want to hire a dinner suit for a party that I'm going to. And the dinner suit hire place says, yes, okay. And so, well, I want it for uh, Friday. And they say, yes, okay. But if Friday comes along and they've still not delivered my dinner suit, they, they ring me up and say, won't be ready until Saturday, unfortunately. That's not good. That's not good lapse of time. It's, if time is of the essence and time has lapsed, then the offer has lapsed. Must be distinguished from invitations, we know. Offers must be distinguished from statements of intent. A statement of intent is just that. It's a statement of, of one's intentions. It's not part of an offer. A response to a request for information is not an offer. Is your car for sale? If your car were for sale, how much would it be? You write back and say $500. And I say, accepted. No. If I'm asking for information, 
If your car were for sale, how much would it be? And you say $500, and you don't say, because you don't need to, and you don't say $500 if it were for sale, but it isn't. You just say $500. I can't turn back to you and say, accept it, because yours is not an offer. It was simply a request for information. And similarly, um, if we have an acceptance, uh, a request for information is not a counter of request for information, a response to request for information, I'm sorry, and a request for information. So we agree. Uh, I'll offer you 500 for your car, and you write back and say accepted, and I say, I write back and say, is there any chance that I can pay this over three months? That's a request for information. We've already got a contract. I've offered you 500. You've said I accepted. Now I'm asking, is it possible that I can pay you over a period of time? That's not a counter offer. It's just a request for information. It's just asking, is it possible that I can pay you over a period of time? Revocation must be. Revocation is a particular type of. It comes from the Latin word "voca," the Latin verb "vocare" to call, and "revocare" is to, re, is to call back. And so, revocation is me calling back an offer. Uh, and it's it's got three possibilities of coming back, and we'll get to those down the bottom. Offer is effective from the moment you receive it. I'm the offer, or you're the offeree. It's effective. The offer is open from the moment that you receive it. It may be orally. I may talk to you, or I may write to you, or email to you, or maybe personally hand you the offer. I may say, there's an offer, and I'm hand it to you on a piece of paper. It will cease to be capable of acceptance. And these are three possibilities for it no longer existing. Remember, if we have it up here, it must still exist. Well, here are three possibilities for it no longer existing. Withdrawal is where I have sent, possibly by mail, surface mail, I've sent an offer to you and I put it into the letter system, to the postal system, and on the way home I changed my mind, I don't really want to sell this. So I phone you up and say, there's a letter on the way, it's got an offer in it, I'm giving you notice now, that offer is no longer applicable, it's no longer open, I'm, I'm withdrawing my offer. So withdrawal of an offer is the withdrawal before you receive it. Revocation, on the other hand, is I've sent you the letter and it's a week has gone by and I've not heard from you and I'm thinking to myself, I don't really want to sell the pen. So I contact you, I phone you up and say, I'm revoking my offer. And I'm, I'm no, my offer is no longer available to be accepted. And so it destroys its existence. So revocation is after you have received it, but before you have accepted it. And rejection, well, rejection can happen in one of two ways. And here it is on the next page, where you say no. And, I'll offer you my pen for three dollars, you say no. I offer you my pen for three dollars and you say no, I'll give you two dollars fifty. That's a counter offer. But they're both rejection. You reject it and simply say no, you're not bothered, you don't want a pen. Or no, I'll offer you two fifty. Yes, you do want it, but you don't want to pay three dollars. That's a counter offer. And a counter offer rejects, destroys the original offer and replaces it with your own version. Any material alteration. Any material alteration to the quantity, the description, the date of delivery, the value involved, material alterations are not acceptance. These are counter offers. An immaterial alteration is acceptable. I said that's okay. But an, a material alteration destroys it and replaces it with a counter offer. Immaterial is not rejection. Immaterial is not counter offer. And a contract will be valid incorporating the immaterial alterations. Acceptance is the other half of the agreement, must be complete and unconditional. Why is that like that? Why is that? Why is this gone strange? Must be complete and unconditional. Subject to allowing for immaterial alterations. The offer must be still be open, we know that. Acceptance communicated, but the offer all in wave. That's a strange word, isn't it? It's nothing to do with the waves on the sea. It's nothing to do with waving your hand. To wave, now where's that gone? <laughs> to wave 
is to forego. If you think about those reward contracts, and I advertise in the Berry Times, I'm not expecting 7 billion people to respond and say, I'm accepting your offer and I'm on my way. That's, that's not going to happen. So in a situation like a reward offer, I waive the right, I forego the right of communication of acceptance. So acceptance must be communicated, but I may, right, may waive my right of communication. And communication may be by a third party, a reliable third party. I could get my significant other to contact you and say, Mike's just busy at the moment, but he's accepting your offer. That's okay. Silence can't be acceptance. <clears throat> I'll sell you my pen for $400. If I don't hear from you, I take it we're in a contract. No? Okay, send me your $400. No, you can't do that. You can't make someone take an action like that. I can't make you take an action rejecting my offer of 400. It may be bad conduct. Acceptance may be my conduct. If I make an offer and you conduct yourself in a way that is consistent with acceptance of my offer, then in a court, the court may say, yeah, that's acceptance, acceptance by conduct. We've got an interesting possibility, haven't we? Well, let's see how acceptance has started. Imagine sitting in a cafe by a, a harbour, uh, a port, nice little country harbour, it's only a little village, and you're sitting at a table with your friends, and, and at the table behind you, some loud mouthed gobby person is saying to his friends, I'll pay 100 euros to the first person to swim across to the other side of the harbour. And you hear it, your friends hear it, and you. Your eyes go, oh, Lord, listen to that gobby person. And five minutes later, a child falls into the harbour on the far side of the, the harbour there. And you, being a hero, you strip off your jacket, drop your trousers, take your shoes off, and you dive in, swim across the harbour. As you're diving in, loudmouth stands up and says, don't think you're accepting my offer because I'm withdrawing it. Well, the acts of acceptance have already started. So he can't withdraw. Ah, you say, but that's not why you dived in to save the child. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. The motivation for your actions of acceptance, the motivation is irrelevant. But knowledge of the matter is important. If you knew the offer existed, and you act in accordance with acceptance of that offer, then you're in a contract and you can claim your 100 euros. The fact that that wasn't the reason why you dived in is irrelevant. If acceptance is by letter, it's effective from the date shown. If it's accepted by letter, it's, accept it's effective from the date shown in the letter. Acceptance must be within a reasonable time. What's a reasonable time? Well, in law, a reasonable time, and I'm being serious here, a reasonable time is a, a time that is reasonable in the circumstances. If it's lapsed, if the offer has lapsed, the offer is still open at the time of the agreement, think about this. If I offer to buy your season ticket to watch Berry Football Club for the 2017-2018 season. And I offer to buy your season ticket for £500. And you say, yes, all right, I'll think about it. Just let me think about it. And I made the offer in July 2017. August comes on the first Games of the season of play, September, October, November, December, January. And eventually you contact me in mid-March and say, Mike, I've been thinking about that offer. Yes, okay, I'll sell you my season ticket for £100. Did I say £105? I'll sell you my, my season ticket for £500. What? There's only two more home games left. You can't actually, no, the offer has lapsed. 
the effort to come. You can't be accepting it within a reasonable time and claim that six months, eight months is a reasonable time. So it has to be within a reasonable time of the offer. If it's an oral offer, you would normally expect oral acceptance. Face to face, I'd expect you to be contacting me, phoning me, emailing me. Ask the tutor, put your acceptance on, ask the tutor, and, and we're in a contract. Emailed offer, two or three days of me making the offer, I'm expecting acceptance within two or three days. The surface mail, okay, a few days, define few. A week, 10 days maybe, depends on your local surface mail system and, and efficiency. Telegrammed offer, a reasonable time commences from the date the telegrammed offer was handed in for delivery. And a reasonable time starts then. But if it's a telegram, telegrams are normally important matters. So urgent matters. So you'd expect acceptance within a reasonable time, within a reasonable time. So that's the introduction to contracts. That sets you off offers, acceptances, invitations, oral acceptance, oral offers, offers to the world at large. And so we'll be looking soon with reference to the international sale of goods we'll be looking at the rights of the buyer the rights the duties the obligations of the seller we'll be looking at those topics in chapter six onwards okay